This AP Psych Review video will be looking at the psychologists of the Disorders Unit, the Treatment of Disorders Unit, and Social Psychology. First up, we've got um, the Rosenhan study in Disorders and Abnormal Behavior. He's not a specific psychologist about disorders, but the Rosenhan study is pretty important. He and some colleagues were voluntarily uh, admitting themselves to mental hospitals, complaining of the symptoms of hearing voices that said empty, dull, and thud. Once admitted, they acted normally. Um, but they just had some very negative experiences, and the lesson one was once labeled, always labeled, and lesson two, the dehumanization of patients in mental institutions. In the treatment of abnormal behavior, there are a few important folks who are uh, involved with therapy. First is going to be Freud. His theory of mind with psychoanalysis, he created talk therapy. He was the father of modern psychology, and most work by others was a reaction to his theories, but for him, within psychoanalysis, uh, listening to patients, um, use, trying to get access to the unconscious mind by using dream interpretation and free association and uh, hypnosis, trying to get uh, past resistance that patients had to possible changes. Mary Cover Jones worked with uh, John Watson. She's known as the mother of behavior therapy. She created what was known as desensitization therapy, which was used to cure phobias. A patient may be desensitized through the repeated introduction of a series of stimuli that approximate the phobia closer and closer to the phobic stimulus. She did not have anything to do with the anxiety portion of it. That's going to be another person coming up. But she did deal with Peter, a three-year-old, and his fear of rabbits. But she was the first behavior therapist. Joseph Volpe was a early, earlier in his career a Freud follower, saw that it wasn't working, and so he took Cover Jones's work and added to it creating what he called systematic desensitization. The idea of reciprocal inhibition, where you have anxiety being inhibited by a feeling or response that is not compatible with the feeling of anxiety. So he used assertiveness training to combat anxiety, and he also had the individuals that he was working with create anxiety hierarchies to try to help use relaxation techniques to have them become desensitized to the phobic stimulus. B.F. Skinner primarily a behaviorist looking at um, behavior only, not thoughts and feelings, created operant conditioning built off the work of Thorndike, reinforcement and punishment, and so any kinds of behavior therapies that use um, aversive conditioning, um, uh, negative consequences or aversive consequences, uh, or positive reinforcement of a appropriate behavior, uh, he can be a, a part of that particular uh, conversation. Um, but the operant conditioning box, which he created and actually raised his daughter in, was uh, an interesting part of how to give feedback. Now, in the context of schools, he also created learning machines. I think I used one of those when I was um, uh, growing up as well. Aaron Beck was originally a psychoanalyst, but um, switched to just cognitive therapy. He's known as the father of cognitive therapy and has a far-reaching influence. So basic, any, basically any kind of cognitive therapy that's out there, he had an influence on. But he was looking at the treatment of clinical depression and the automatic thoughts that we had, because the automatic thoughts that we do have typically are distorted thinking. And so he helped his patients slash clients identify and evaluate their thoughts, identify the irrationality, and then ideally change those thoughts. Carl Rogers was a humanistic psychologist. He said that people were in therapy for growth, not to fix some sort of a problem that they had. And so he created person-centered therapy where the therapeutic relationship between the therapist and the client was foremost. The therapist's, part of the therapist's job was to create unconditional positive regard rather than using the conditions of worth that typically were a part of most people's experiences. So his focus was on self-concept and self-esteem. How did the individual feel about themselves? How did they perceive themselves? And how, did they, how positively did they view themselves? Albert Ellis, founder of Rational Emotive Therapy, which is now called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, he said that beliefs contributed to emotional pain and that he actively stressed actively working to change a client's self-defeating beliefs and behaviors by demonstrating their irrationality, their self-defeatism, and their rigidity. And contrary to Rogers, he had a more rough confrontational style of therapy where he told it like it was as opposed to trying to be just reflective and non-directive. So Rogers was non-directive. Albert Ellis was definitely a directive therapist. In the field of social psychology, which is one of my all-time favorites, 
you first have Solomon Ash, a Gestalt psychologist, but more known for his conformity study. He used deception, told people that the lines they were looking at were about um, perception, but uh, it was really about uh, conformity. Would they conform to the other Confederates and what they said if, if it was a wrong answer? Students of his included Milgram. Uh, Ash also studied impression formation and the social context of human behavior. Uh, impression formation is huge within um, a particular field within sociology as well. Stanley Milgram wanted to understand Nazis and their obedience to authority. And you can see in the background of the picture is that panel of switches that went from 15 to 450 volts, the obedience study, and the shock machine. So the teacher and the learner, the, so there's more deception involved here. The learner uh, not really getting shocked. The teacher, how far would he or she go? And how far would the average person go? Were the Nazis the exception to the rule, or were they just human like everyone else and subject to situational obedience? Phil Zimbardo, the discovering psychology guy, the Stanford prison study guy, um, lots of ethical questions from his study with the college students in the psychology uh, department prison that was created. Uh, but the impact of roles and how situations impact individual behavior. One of the video titles is called The Power of the Situation. Another one is called um, Constructing Social Reality. Both sets of ideas incredibly important in understanding human behavior. After his uh, initial studies on uh, the roles in the prison, uh, he also studied shyness and time perception. And his books include, among many others, The Lucifer Effect and The Time Paradox. Leon Festinger, student, uh, student of Kurt Lewin, who studied leadership styles, he, uh, Festinger looked at proximity effects in friends and romance partners. And so when we look at the four factors of attraction, when we look at competence and physical attractiveness and the other factors, proximity comes from Festinger. He looked at when prophecy fails, how do adherents and believers deal with it when the prophecy that was created for their group fails? So he started creating some lab experiments in social psych and then created the theory of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, just look it up. It's fantastic. Um, wonderful, wonderful stuff going on with that. Uh, justification of effort, uh, all sorts of how we adapt to uh, ideas in our heads that conflict with each other or when our own behaviors conflict with the views that we have of ourselves. He also created social comparison theory the idea that we evaluate ourselves in relation to others and our perceptions of those other people. This is the end of this section of Psychology Review, Psychologists.